All right, let's do this. Hopefully it's not too windy. Hopefully you can hear me, guys. How's it going? Pretty special backdrop, huh? Mount Hood. Look at the lengths I go to for a video. Incredible. <laughs> Humans have lived through some pretty cold times, and one of the coldest was definitely a period we call the Younger Dryas. It didn't last very long, just about 1,000 years, but it started really abruptly and it ended really abruptly. Now, the typical YouTube video on this subject is uh, basically pseudo-archaeological bollocks, in my opinion. Wild, unfounded claims, unsourced videos, tales of pyramid building globe spanning ancient civilizations that were wiped out in the cataclysm to end all cataclysms and these evil archaeologists are just trying to keep it secret to protect their precious theses and fifty thousand dollar a year annual salary you can tell from the contempt in my voice that i think that's pure nonsense and uh, the reality is that it's one of the most widely researched areas in the Paleolithic. So I'm going to today try my best to uh, present the latest thinking on the subject. We're going to talk about what caused it, uh, did it kill the megafauna, how did humans react, and then wrap it all up with a discussion of uh, how bad was it really. Uh, just a couple of caveats. All sources are in the description. You can check them out, just look at the little number. There's no secrets here, no conspiracy. And uh, bear in mind, oh, I'll protect the microphone from the wind. Bear in mind that I'm no expert. I don't pretend to be an expert. I'm just a guy sitting on a rock with a wicked hat and uh, nothing better to do with my time. So take everything I say with a pinch of salt and by all means, uh, double check what I say, read the sources. That's all highly encouraged. So without further ado, let's talk about the Younger Dryas. So before I start, it's worth quickly covering what was the Younger Dryas, because I'm aware not everyone spends as much time on the internet as I do. Before the Younger Dryas, life was on the up and up. The height of the last Ice Age had ended about 8,000 years before, and the Paleolithic inhabitants of the Northern Hemisphere were living through a 2,000 year warm period we call the Bolling Alarod Interstadial. Then out of nowhere, things started to change. Between roughly 12.9 and 11.7 thousand years ago, the climate of the Northern Hemisphere suddenly started becoming colder and drier. To give you an example of how much Europe declined in temperature between 2 to 6 degrees C, depending on how far north you go, glaciers that had been melting after the end of the last ice age began to advance once again. This temperature change may have occurred in just a few decades, so that's really super quick in Earth terms. Certainly a chilly time to be alive, no doubt about that. However, it wasn't all doom and gloom. Recent evidence has shown that despite the overall decline in temperature, summers still would have been short but warm. You could sort of compare it to modern places that have very continental climates, like Russia. No doubt bloody cold in the winter, but punctuated by very warm summers. These temperature changes largely affected the Northern Hemisphere. In the Southern Hemisphere, the picture is a tad more complex. In Venezuela, the climate cooled by around 3 degrees. But in the Caribbean, Southern Africa, Antarctica, Australia, and New Zealand, the climate seems to have stayed about the same, or even warmed slightly. In a study of Australia's climate in the last 35,000 years, there was no evidence for cooling during the Younger Dryas, and conditions may even have been wetter rather than drier. So that gives you a, an idea of what the Younger Dryas was. Now, why would the Northern Hemisphere get colder and the Southern Hemisphere stay about the same or maybe even a little bit warmer? Well, that brings us to our first controversy, what caused the Younger Dryas? No video on the Younger Dryas is complete without a discussion of its causes. This is probably the biggest area of debate. The cooling of the Northern Hemisphere and warming of the Southern Hemisphere is good evidence of ocean currents being disrupted. A lot of the Northern Hemisphere is kept warm by tropical waters being carried north. When these ocean currents are reduced, obviously, the north gets colder, 
But the southern hemisphere gets warmer as warm water is trapped in the south. Changes in microscopic life also suggest that ocean currents had been disrupted. As the last ice age came to an end and the glaciers started melting, huge amounts of fresh water was dumped into the Atlantic and Arctic oceans. In particular, the drainage of this huge prehistoric glacial lake, Agassiz, is believed to have been a significant factor. There's been this really long running debate for the past three decades as to what route this water took to the ocean. Did it flow east along the Lawrence River into the Atlantic, or north along the Mackenzie River into the Arctic Ocean. From what I've read, it seems that the northern route along the Mackenzie River is more widely accepted due to the fact it might have reduced ocean currents by more than 30%, compared to an estimated 15% from the Lawrence River. Physical evidence such as huge boulder pits along the Mackenzie River uh, provide further evidence of this huge amount of water being released. This theory is not without its criticisms though. Firstly, at the start of the Alarod warming period, sea levels rose by 20 meters over 500 years. That's a lot. This is called Meltwater Pulse 1A. However, this didn't cause a breakdown of ocean currents, quite the opposite. It seems warm water from the deep ocean was released during this time. Meanwhile, at the start of the Younger Dryas, although sea levels were continuing to rise, it doesn't have that same distinct pulse. This might be because it isn't just the volume of water that is released which interrupts ocean currents, but also where it is released. Meltwater Pulse 1A possibly deposited much of the water straight into the Caribbean along the Mississippi River, as opposed to Lake Agassiz draining north into the Arctic Ocean. Other scientists argue changing ocean currents alone might not be enough to cause this really sudden Younger Dryas that changing ocean currents combined with reduced warmth from the sun and altered atmospheric conditions best explain the sudden downturn in temperature. And there's also those that believe it was caused by an asteroid impact. The highly controversial Younger Dryas impact hypothesis states that an asteroid or perhaps a fragmented asteroid exploded above North America at the start of the Younger Dryas. This was the trigger for the destabilization of the ice sheets that led to the interruption of ocean currents and possibly triggered widespread wildfires. As evidence for this, archaeologists have cited the presence of black layers of soil and increased presence of various forms of minerals, such as nanodiamonds, platinum, and magnetic microspherules, microspherules, which is impossible to say. And uh, these are argued to be evidence of an extraterrestrial impact. Evidence of biomass burning has been found in the spikes of combustion aerosols in the soil and ice of the Antarctic, Greenland, and Russia, which suggests that perhaps as much as 9% of the Earth's biomass was consumed by fire. Since 2007, when the first academic paper was published, many other papers have reported similar signals, particularly of these spikes in platinum at layers dated to the Younger Dryas, such as in Mexico, Greenland, Chile, and most recently South Africa. More and more sites are discovered each year, and I think it's fair to say it is becoming less controversial. These studies have been conducted by real scientists from world-leading universities such as Harvard, so it's really not for me a guy who sits on rocks reading off a notebook to say that they're wrong. But I do really strongly reject the accusation that's often thrown around on YouTube that the critics of this theory are just old fuddy-duddies who can't accept new evidence. For example, the Earth certainly doesn't need an asteroid impact for its temperature to vary. The Younger Dryas was one of three quick declines in temperature during the end of the last ice age, so were these all caused by asteroids? The Earth is constantly being bombarded by small asteroids and comets and all of these things, so the presence of these impact markers does not necessarily mean there was a cataclysmic impact. They can also be caused by volcanoes. Studies have replicated them, just creating campfires, and all sorts of other natural processes could be responsible. 
The dating of these sites is sometimes problematic. At Barber Creek, the Younger Dryas boundary was said to be 100 centimeters below the surface, yet at depths more than 100 centimeters, charcoal was dated to 10,500 years ago. This is later than the Younger Dryas, so can the dating really be relied on? In the case of magnetic microspherals, <laughs> I just can't say that. There's no consensus as to their exact nature. Some are reported as round and smooth, others rougher, others tear-shaped. Are these all evidence of an impact? This ambiguity can lead to really confusing results. In a blind test of the Younger Dryas impact, two different laboratories reported different results, and the one that did report a spike in these magnetic balls found them in a layer dated to 1300 years after the Younger Dryas. Other sites also suggest these impact proxies are not unique to the Younger Dryas. At Bull Creek, a spike in nano diamonds was genuinely reported at the Younger Dryas boundary, but also at 3000 years ago and in modern times. So are these good evidence of an impact? We'd surely have noticed the modern one. As for the black mats, they are black due to an increase in organic carbon. Not all Younger Dryas sites have them, but in a study of 97 sites in North America, two-thirds did. These black mats can be caused by wetland, marshy conditions, and are common to various periods of time. In a study of 13 black matted sites dated between 6,000 and 40,000 years ago, 10 of the 13 black layers showed an increase in alleged impact markers. So either we are bombarded very frequently by these asteroids, or it could be that wetland conditions happen to be better at preserving these tiny minerals for some reason. I don't mean to harp on about all the criticisms, but it's just that these are rarely discussed in other YouTube videos and frequently just dismissed out of hand. So did an asteroid cause the Younger Dryas? In my opinion, the case hasn't been made yet, but I was honestly surprised by how many uh, scientific papers are coming out. Um, maybe not in direct support of it, but at least suggesting we should look at it more seriously. So I'm going to keep an open mind. It's certainly not for me, Mr. Nobody, to dispute the findings of Harvard scientists. Time will tell, I suppose. But... What I do seriously take issue is in a lot of these uh, videos talking about the Younger Dryas, uh, every new paper is accepted as if there's no debate in science, as if these things aren't extremely complicated. It's only right that we demand a, a really high level of evidence for new theories. Otherwise, how do we know what's true? Anyway, on to controversy number two. How come all the mammoths are dead? In the Pleistocene, there were all sorts of huge animals that spanned the globe, such as mammoths, woolly rhinos, giant sloths, calicotheres, which looks super cool to me, and the giant Irish elk that, surprise surprise, lived in Ireland, and also practically everywhere else. Sadly, in our time, these huge beasts are no more, and there has been a long-running debate as to whether humans or climate change events like the Younger Dryas killed them off, particularly with regards to megafauna in the Americas. Let's start with the evidence for humans killing everything. If we are to assume that humans were the driving force behind these extinctions, then it stands to reason that the timing of their extinctions would mirror human expansion, starting in Africa, then Eurasia, then Australia, then the Americas. This is exactly the pattern we see in the archaeological record. 125,000 years ago, Homo sapiens were still largely confined to Africa, and animals in Africa were on average 50% smaller than all other continents. From 100,000 years ago, large animals in Eurasia start decreasing in size. This was a time when not only Homo sapiens had left Africa, but also Neanderthals and Denisovans had spread across the continent. Between 100,000 and 40,000 years ago, animals rapidly decreased in size in Australia. When did humans arrive? About 60,000 years ago. Whilst all this is going on, regardless of changes in climate, large animals remained abundant in the Americas until right at the end of the Pleistocene, when, you guessed it, humans arrived. 
The timing just seems too perfect not to be connected, and on top of that we also have great evidence of humans hunting these large animals. The most recent discovery being an 82 foot long, 5 foot deep pit dug by hand outside Mexico City that contained the remains of 14 dead mammoths. Dated to around 15,000 years ago, archaeologists suggest that these animals were scared into the pit by Paleo-Americans, perhaps using fire, before butchering them. This is really one of the top finds of 2019, and what is really fascinating about it is that all 14 of the mammoths had their left shoulder blades removed. Did that particular bone have some significance to the people that hunted these animals? Just interesting that all 14 were missing it. However, this is not to say that climate did not play an important role. For example, one study suggests that animals in Africa started declining in size around 4 million years ago, when small australopiths, or even pre-australopiths, roamed Africa. These tiny relatives of ours and their primitive tools were definitely not top of the food chain, so a much more likely explanation is that expanding grasslands shrank the habitat of megafauna that lived on shrubs and trees and similar plants. Though the authors do concede that the evolution of more powerful hominins like Homo erectus may have sped up their extinction around the 1.5 million year ago mark. In the Americas, using the frequency of radiocarbon dated sites as a proxy for population, a 2018 study suggested that in what is now the USA, mammoth, horse, and saber-toothed cat populations declined during the Clovis period before the Younger Dryas, which implies that humans were responsible. However, populations of mastodon and ground sloth did not decline until the Younger Dryas, which suggests that for some species, climate change was a driving factor in their extinction. It's also possible that it was the warm period before the Younger Dryas, the Bolling Alarod, that put a strain on many of these animals. Ancient DNA analysis shows a really complicated picture of localized extinctions, migrations, and replacement that closely mirrors the timing of warm periods rather than cold snaps like the Younger Dryas. I've got to admit, when I read this, this really struck out to me as something that made a lot of sense. After all, these animals had lived through the last ice age, so why would a return to those cold conditions threaten them? It's possible that climate change forced certain species into various refugia where their preferred habitat remained, shrinking their natural ranges, and when conditions improved, they were unable to expand as they had done in previous times due to the presence of the new top predator humans. This created isolated pockets of megafauna that just gradually became extinct one by one as they were picked off by humans or fell victim to disease and, and further habitat loss. I hope I showed that the, the causes of these Pleistocene extinctions is really complicated. The causes probably vary by species and by region. There's probably no single answer to it. But I will say this, my final thought on that issue. If humans were not involved in any way, shape or form, then it's hard to explain how megafauna in New Zealand survived until the 13th century when the Maori arrived, and mammoths survived on Wrangell Island off the coast of Siberia until about 2000 BCE. That's after the construction of the Great Pyramids. Think about that for a second. When Egypt was uh, starting to flourish as a civilization, mammoths still walked the earth. And that's really very far north in our planet, so if it was the, the cold conditions that really wiped these guys out, how do we explain that? Anyway, other than uh, making mammoth stew, how did humans react to the Younger Dryas? I can't possibly hope to cover the entire world, so I'm just going to pick four places that show a variety of different adaptations. Japan, the American Rockies, Britain, and the Levant. So starting with Japan, 
During the Younger Dryas, it seems life in Japan did not change significantly. The main change seems to have been a slight migration southward. In contrast to the Bolling Alarod, there are no confirmed sites in the northernmost island of Hokkaido. Subsistence strategies didn't seem to change much either. Animals like the Sika deer remained popular on the menu. There did seem to be a small decline in population, but not enough to disrupt trade or isolate communities, and technologies such as pottery were still widely practiced. All in all, you could say that the Younger Dryas had a small effect on Japan, but nothing too dramatic. In the Americas, the Younger Dryas saw the transition from the Clovis culture, which spanned North America practically coast to coast, to more regional traditions. In the Rockies and Western Great Plains, this new tradition is called the Folsom culture. The Rockies were probably very sparsely populated during the Clovis period. Most archaeological sites contain just a few points. Very rarely do we see large sites such as caches of tools and the odd mammoth kill site, like Dent for example, where 15 mammoths were recovered with Clovis points. Still, overall, the impression is one of a very large, empty landscape occupied by highly mobile groups of hunter-gatherers. The Folsom culture, which starts to appear around 12,800 BP, just at the cusp of the Younger Dryas, also has many isolated and sparsely populated sites, but they seemed to be using the landscape more intensively. Some sites become larger, they were staying longer, and local resources were used more intensively. One site, Lindenmeyer, particularly stands out. Over 600 stone points were found. This is very different to Clovis period sites. Occupation of valleys was also popular amongst Folsom groups, perhaps because these acted as natural funnels for migrating animals. Furthermore, Clovis and Folsom assemblages overlap in the northern USA, dispelling the idea that Clovis people were wiped out by a cataclysm and replaced by Folsom groups. Over in Britain, the archaeological record for the Younger Dryas contains a little mystery. We have found plenty of burials before the Younger Dryas, plenty of burials after, but absolutely none during it. No human remains whatsoever. At first, it was explained away as a sampling error. Archaeologists just hadn't found any yet. But after so many years of searching now, this is becoming harder and harder to accept. We also know that Britain hadn't been abandoned because we find other evidence of human activity like worked bone. So there are a few possible ways we could explain this. First, sampling error is still possible. Second, the ancient British abandoned higher ground to live along the coast, which has since been swallowed by the sea. Third, burial practices happen to change to excarnation instead of inhumation. Fourth, caves that had been used for burial perhaps became harder to access as glaciers and ice expanded in more mountainous regions. And number five, perhaps the ground became too cold and hard to actually dig into. Northern Europe did suffer a population decline during the Younger Dryas, so this smaller population combined with perhaps some of these other factors may explain the disappearance of these ancient Brits' bodies. Finally, in the Levant, human society had been undergoing a revolution for many thousands of years before the Younger Dryas. Called the Broad Spectrum Revolution, humans were using local resources so intensively that they were able to abandon nomadic lifestyles and settle into permanent villages with stone buildings and everything. I've actually made a whole video on the origins of agriculture, or at least one theory behind its origins for anyone interested. It's flying up in the cards, you know where it is. I don't know anything about chickens or farming. In some ways, the Younger Dryas interrupted this process. People in the Southern Levant may have returned to a more mobile lifestyle, perhaps moving once a year with the seasons. Still, the core elements of their lifestyle remained though. Harvesting wild grains and nuts, hunting small game that reliably reproduced, and the building of stone villages. However, it could be argued that the Younger Dryas was a catalyst for human development. As the climate dried, woodlands shrank and grasslands expanded. It is possible that these Natufians, as we call them, gradually switched to exploiting more and more grasses and relying less and less on nuts. 
This set the scene for the emergence of domestication and true agricultural societies that occurred once the Younger Dryas ended and the warm, wet conditions of our time period, the Holocene, began. This is all still up for debate, it's very complicated, but as I said, it's possible that rather than pausing human development, the Younger Dryas was an essential piece of it. So now that I've got all of those uh, points out of the way, let's try and answer the question, how bad was the Younger Dryas? Was it caused by a cataclysmic asteroid impact? Probably not, but it's possible. Did it wipe out all the large animals on Earth? Definitely not. Maybe it was responsible for some of them uh, going extinct, but definitely not the full range of large animals that existed in the Pleistocene. Did it destroy human civilization? Again, no. If you lived at a very northerly uh, latitude, you would have been affected by it, definitely, and you probably would have moved further south. But humans adapted to it in a wide variety of ways. Some it really affected, some it didn't affect so much. And some, it may have even been the catalyst for human civilization. So, it's really a mixed bag. Now, there's one more thing I've got to say on the human civilization front. I know people are going to talk about it in the comments, so I've got to bring it up. The rising sea levels. So, before the Younger Dryas, in that bowling Alarod, at the start of that, there was that melt water pulse 1A, where sea levels were estimated to have risen by 20 meters over 500 years. That is a lot in Earth's terms and geological terms. That's very rapid sea level rising. Is 20 meters in 500 years enough to wipe out a globe-spanning civilization? I think not. They're not very... Uh, they can't be that advanced if that level of sea rise is going to scrub every trace of them from the planet. What about after the Younger Dryas? There's another alleged pulse, Meltwater Pulse 1b. That's estimated to have risen sea levels by a mere 40 millimeters a year. Just four centimeters. Whew, I mean, is that enough to scrub every trace of a globe-spanning civilization off the planet? I can't believe it. I can't believe it, guys. There's definitely plenty of archaeological sites that are buried underwater, and it would be great if we knew about them. Was Atlantis destroyed by a mere four centimeters a year? Please, please, come on, let's be realistic here. Anyway, thanks so much for watching the video. Big thanks to my Patreons for supporting me, as always, particularly my top-tier Patreons here. Uh, consider supporting me. I put a lot of research into this video. I climbed a bloody mountain. Don't let the sun fool you. It's extremely cold and windy where I am right now. And uh, so link is and all that stuff is down below. And... Uh, I'll see you at the next video. Bye. See ya. Quick sip of tea. Absolutely essential when climbing mountains to have a tea. Christ, that's hot. What a fantastic place. Mount Hood, Oregon. Visit it. Thanks again, Patreons. I'm rambling. I'm rambling.